So part 38 uh, that prepares a table before me, um, wild harvest edibles. And uh, as, as always, whenever you uh, in, embark on a, a health challenge that you uh, try to partner up with someone who has a similar philosophy of care and of health and wellness that you do. And the information shared here is a educational uh, event and uh, that it should just become maybe a part of your wellness toolbox if that's something you desire to pursue. And that like any medical advice or any kind of advice you might get from anywhere that you follow up with it and do your own research and due diligence before embarking on practicing that whatever it might be <clears throat> in any part of life. And the doctor of future Thomas, Thomas Edison said, will give no medicine, but will instruct his patients in the care of the human frame and diet and the cause and prevention of disease. And we're seeing that as being a very important part of where the rubber meets the road as far as maintaining health and wellness. Ellen White said that way back in 1885 in Councils and Diet and Testimonies for the Church that there are many ways of practicing the healing art, that there is only one way that heaven approves. God's remedies are the simple agencies of nature that will not tax or debilitate the system through their powerful properties. Pure air and water, cleanliness, a proper diet, purity of life, and a firm trust in God are remedies for the want of which thousands are dying. Yet these remedies are going out of date because their skillful use requires work that the people do not appreciate. Fresh air, exercise, pure water, and clean, sweet premises are within the reach of all, with but little expense, but drugs are expensive, both in the outlay of means and the effect produced upon the system. God wants us to be healthy, and he says in 3 John 1, 2, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health, just as your soul prospers. And the disciples wanted that for us as well. In Romans 12, 1 and 2, uh, Paul says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Tonight's focal point is honey locust, Gladitia trichanthos. It's a uh, rather large tree, a deciduous tree in the pea family of ACA. It's also known as the thorn locust um, because it has very large thorns. You can see in the lower picture, the size of those thorns that are present. As the tree ages, the thorns become less prominent and prevalent but they are very, very significant. Prevents tree climbers uh, and a, is a very uh, prominent part of the tree. <clears throat> it's a native to Eastern and Central North America, but it may be cultivated and planted in, in other areas as well. <clears throat> it prefers moist fertile upland areas, woodland soils, as well as bottoms and bottomlands and floodplains for areas where it grows. It can grow quite tall, up to 100 feet tall in some locations. Very thick uh, branched thorns. And there is another locust, the black locust, which is not uh, edible. Uh, we'll talk about that aspect of this here in a moment. But the black locust has, has spines too, but has short spines and much larger leaves than the honey locust. So it has gray to black bark, uh, kind of uh, plated in places with furrows in it. We'll see a better picture of that here further on in our presentations. The, the flowers are very fragrant and a mix of perfect and imperfect flowers. What that means is that a perfect flower has both male parts and female parts. So it has the stigma style and ovary, as well as the anther filament and stamen. <clears throat> imperfect flowers are those that have a male flower and a female flower on the same tree, sometimes on a different tree. So there are monoecious and dioecious plants. Monoecious means one. That means that the flowers, the male and female flowers are on the same plant. Uh, dioecious is gonna have a male and a female uh, plant, like for example, the ginkgo tree is a male plant and a female plant. <clears throat> so it has a mix of those two different types of flowers on it, the, the imperfect and perfect. <clears throat> the fruit are flattened, twisted, spiraling pods. Uh, quite sizable in nature. In fact, the pods are larger than that that is found on the black locust. Black locust is smaller and more flattened and doesn't have a spiral uh, capability to it. It has a sticky sweet pulp and a bean-like seed in the pod. 
So the, the pulp is uh, present there between May and June, and that's when you can eat the, the pods and the, and the young beans. Uh, September to October, you have the hardened, the hardened pods uh, present, and we'll see how we use those here as we, as we go forward. So edibility, the, both the seeds and the fresh seed pods are edible. The young seeds are the more desirable edible part of the plant. <clears throat> the mature seeds are very, very uh, tough and difficult to process. Uh, may be able to do that with, um, <clears throat> with the use of a pressure cooker or an Instapot, uh, but uh, reports that I've seen of using them for food is that they just pass right through the system that even soaking and prolonged boiling leaves them still hard uh, and using them attempts to use them in a a blender or food processor type of situation is very difficult to achieve <clears throat> they just bounce around like marbles essentially so they're very tough bean when they are in their their mature state <clears throat> Uh, so you can see the, the pods hanging there, very long, kind of spiraling in nature. You can see down the one outer edge there on the left of one of those pods there, just the, the it looks like vertebra going down the back of the spine of the, of the bean pod. You can see some young bean pods down lower. You can eat them, uh, the flesh and the beans uh, right there in the green states, rather sweet in nature, uh, but they uh, <clears throat> become harder and the beans are almost impalatable, uh, but the pods are used and we'll see how they're used here in a moment. You can see the bark here, kind of plate-like again in nature with the furrows in between and the spines. Typically a first year spine is gonna be just a single spine. As they grow and mature, they branch and become more prolific in their, their spine structure. In the upper right picture is a picture of the flowers and the very small bipinately arranged leaves. So the flowers are small. They're not large in nature, but very, very inconspicuous. <clears throat> so the pods, as they mature, become bitter. So when they're in their young succulent stage, they're more edible. Then they go through a bitter stage, which you wouldn't want to consume them. And then there's a way to process them once they've matured and dried. So they, they are uh, in the same family as the carob bean. So we think of John the Baptist eating locusts and honey. And the whole pod in its young states is, is very sweet and edible. And it turns out that the pod retains that sweetness after it matures. So you can harvest it. And carob isn't made from the carob bean so much as the carob pod. They actually remove the beans, unlike chocolate and things like that, where they're actually processing the, the bean itself, they're actually processing the pod. So you harvest the mature dry pod. You can see that in the lower right picture of um, the upper picture there. And then there's a drink there that's made of the carob powder, not carob powder, but locust, honey locust powder and some, some energy balls that are made there from the powder of the, the honey locust pod. So soak the pods in water, bring that water to a boil and place the pods in the water and let it soak for up to four hours and actually even up to two days, they're still fine. Basically what that does is softens up the pods and allows you to strip the seeds, the bean-like seeds from the pods. I don't think it does a thing to the, to the beans themselves because they take a lot of processing to make them palatable and edible. So strip those seeds from the softened pods, then break or cut the pods into smaller pieces. And then you can see how a uh, food dehydrator is used or an oven or somewhere else where they're able to dry. So dry those pods in pieces. Then grind those pods in a, some kind of a grinder, like a coffee grinder or a mortar and, pest, mortar and pestle, uh, other types of grinding apparatus. <clears throat> and then that pod powder can be used in various cooking type of applications where you want a sweet kind of tasty powder. So in baking, you can use it just as you get it. Uh, other things where a texture may be more noticeable, like a, a, a smoothie or in other things like that, you may want to sift it into a finer grade and then use the, the more coarse grade for your baking applications and a finer grade for smoothies and things like that where texture would be more apparent to the palate. <clears throat> so it doesn't dissolve in water. Uh, it uh, maintains a, 
and more uh, granular consistency within the fluid that it's a part of. So the finer it is, the more palatable it is in that regard, as well as more digestible because you have a greater surface area that your body's digestive uh, systems can work upon. So use that powder in baking and smoothings, energy bars and balls in different ways. Uh, it's naturally sweet. So anything that you'd be using it in, you could cut the sugar uh, because it's using the natural sugar that is in the, the honey locust pods. Again, it's processed in a very similar way that you would to carob. And in fact, uh, I believe they're in the same, the same family. So this is a range map of the honey locust. Uh, the bright green is where it's very, very common. The dark green is uh, less common. And the least common is the orange or, or yellow. <clears throat> so actually the very far Northeast, it doesn't grow. And actually Washington and Oregon, it doesn't seem to have a presence. There may be cultivated varieties of it, but in Idaho, Montana, uh, it's present. And there's no reason it couldn't grow here. I'm not sure exactly why it's not, it just hasn't been transplanted here evidently. But it also, in doing some reading about it, it tends to be quite invasive. Once it gets started and growing, it is quite difficult to uh, eradicate. <clears throat> so that can be a good thing or a bad thing. Great for fence posts, uh, hedges. The thorns are great for, for hedges in that regard. Uh, and the wood is actually very good for a number of applications. Uh, it's a very tough, dense wood. So some keys for identification, small flowers, large twisted pods, long, large branching spines, and tiny tooth feathery pinnately compound leaves. A warning just here that there are black locusts and the black locust pods are toxic. There's a toxic agent called a rubbin in, in it. So you don't want to confuse the, the honey locust for the black locust. So you just wanna make sure that that differentiation is, is pointed out. Make sure you're getting a honey locust and not, not a black locust. So some medicinal usages of it. Here's a great picture of the leaves of the honey locust. Very tiny leaves. The black locust leaves are larger by two or three times and are more um, not bipinately, like this is bipinately compound versus uh, pinnately compound. Mm -hmm. So it has medicinal usages as anesthetic, that is like a painkiller, antiseptic. So that's going to be that's going to be an anti um, antimicrobial in that regard, anti-cancer, and functions as a digestive aid. In addition to that, so for us for upper respiratory issues, it's beneficial for sore throats, coughs, and colds. Make a, a tea or an infusion of the honey locust bark and roots it is very beneficial for colds and coughs. And the inner bark is very beneficial, used as a tea for sore throats. As a gargle or as a drink, mm. it can be consumed and helps to mitigate uh, sore throats uh, discomfort. Interestingly enough, smallpox and measles, the seed pods are used in treating that. Uh, <clears throat> so you add water to a half a teaspoon of the honey locust pod powder and make a thick syrup. Or you can use the fresh seed pod pulp. That can be consumed internally, as well as it may be applied to the, the smallpox lesions and the measles lesions in addition. <clears throat> in digestion and whooping cough, the honey locust bark infusion, again, is helpful for both whooping cough and indigestion. Kind of two different ends of the spectrum here, one dig uh, digestive GI issue and the other uh, a, a coughing spell. <clears throat> so the inner uh, 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 infusion of the honey bark, honey locust bark is helpful in that regard. So anti-cancer properties, the, the leaves, the inner bark, and the spines all have been indicated as being beneficial for anti-cancer roles. So all three, the leaves, inner bark, and spines are effective against cancer cell proliferation. That means growing. That's the problem with cancer typically is it continues to grow and proliferate without having to stop signals in them because all cells have a predetermined lifespan. All of our cells have different lifespans associated with them, different types of cells. Bone being the longest, about 10 years to regenerate an entire new set of bone cells. Uh, whereas things like skin and eyes are much more rapid. Intestinal lining would be considered a skin. So that's very rapidly regenerating. So place the leaves uh, and the inner bark and spines in a pot to make a decoction. So decoction would be the, the preferential 
method of utilizing the properties in the leaves, inner bark, and spines. So you're going to cold soak them for several hours in that water, then boil it, bring it to a simmer. Uh, but you're not going to continue boiling it, just go it down, down to a, a simmer for 15 to 20 minutes or until the water volume, you want to do it at least 15 or 20 minutes. If it if the water volume goes down to half more rapidly than that, then add some water and continue to simmer because you want to get at least that amount of, of simmering time to extract the beneficial properties out of the spines, leaves, and bark. So then strain that through a cheesecloth. And then once the, the, the remnants have cooled, just squeeze any last minute bit of, of uh, juice out of those soggy remnants because there's still good properties in that. Then pour it into a jar and use it within two days or, or freeze it. Got a little juxtaposition there of the R and the F. <clears throat> so freeze it for later use. Essentially one cup of the decoction per day uh, is a useful dosage that could be spread throughout the day, that one cup, or you could drink it all at once. Uh, it has a very much of a higher concentration of, of therapeutic properties than does, does a tea or an infusion. So it's a longer extraction process. So the Saudi Journal of Biological Sciences in December 2014, Muhammad and Company uh, <clears throat> published an article entitled Flavonoid Constituents, Cytotoxic and Antioxidant Activities of Honey Locust Leaves. That's Gladysia uh, trichanthos is the honey locust. <clears throat> And uh, cytotoxic means that it's toxic to cells. And in particular, this is cancer cells. And antioxidant benefits. Oxidation is one of the inflammatory mechanisms. And we know that almost all disease has an underlying basis of, uh, of inflammation as being an underlying causal agent. So it's anti-mutagenic, i.e. it protects the DNA. Anti-cancer, cytotoxic and is beneficial in treating rheumatoid, rheumatoid arthritis. Its highest activity was exhibited by 100 milligrams of an ethylene or ethanol extraction process uh, in vivo. So that means in, a living, in living cells versus uh, in vitro, which is typically how most things are initially studied is in, in cell culture in a test tube. <clears throat> so this was actually in a living organism. 97.89% potency of the ethanol extraction. So 100, 100 milligram uh, potency. So they looked at this, tested against different cells, liver cells, colon cancers, liver cancers, larynx cancers, breast cancer, and cervix cancer. So those are fairly common cancers. It's not the whole gamut, but likely that it would have benefit on other types of cancers as well. But these are very common ones that have established cell lines like, and uh, um, that can be tested for and tested against. <clears throat> Another article by Zhang et al. from the, I believe it's University of Michigan actually, in Plant Medicine, Medicina. that's a uh, annual publication. This one was published in 2014. Honey locust flowers and its bioactive constituents. So this study actually looked at the flowers of the honey locust to see if there were any properties in it that were uh, of therapeutic benefit. And they found that in their study, hexane and ethyl acetate and methanolic extractions, so that's an alcohol extraction, of the flowers of the honey locust tree had both antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, and anti-tumor uh, properties and activity. <clears throat> and they tested this against prostate, colon, lung, breast, and gastric cancers, again, all showing inhibition at about uh, 25 micrograms per milliliter was the dosage level, as I recall. Uh, so those are cell lines. Again, I think this was in vitro as opposed to in vivo, uh, but it so showed inhibition levels. So it looked like they used a lower concentration than what they used for the bark uh, extract or the leaf extract that they used in the Saudi study. So there are some uh, good uh, things on the pike coming down the pike for, for the usage of, of honey locusts within the realm of anti-cancer effects. And you can just start with a decoction of the spines, leaves, and inner bark. So to do a honey uh, locust extract, this is similar to the ethanol extract that they would have done for the study. 
a one and a half pint crushed honey locust spines and leaves. And then you take one quart of 80 to 100 proof vodka or other drinkable alcohol if you're gonna do it that way. Otherwise, you can use vegetable glycerin for internal use. That'd be my preferred uh, method. Although there is probably not quite as uh, thorough of an extraction with the glycerin. I'm not sure that that has been tested. There definitely is a slight difference in shelf life with the glycerin extraction, shorter shelf life with glycerin versus, versus ethanol. But if you're wanting to preserve your liver and stay away from any form of alcohol, glycerin would be the preferred mechanism of extraction. <clears throat> so place those crushed leaves and spines in a jar to a three quarter mark, and then fill it with glycerin, vegetable glycerin, or or the alcohol for the extraction process. So seal that jar tightly and then place it in a warm sunny spot in the windowsill for four to six weeks, which is a typical methodology for doing extractions. Shaking it every couple of days. So stirring it up and increasing the surface area. Uh, <clears throat> so strain that through a coffee filter once you've had that four to six week marination and stirring and use the, the extract, you can see the fluid extract above uh, as uh, a beneficial agent for uh, working with the various conditions that we've talked about here. <clears throat>